Almost 50 years ago, Apollo 8 left Earth for the moon. While in orbit, astronaut Bill Anders decided to take an unexpected photo. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty. Hey, don't take that, it's not scheduled. <laughs> Later named Earthrise, the photo captured our planet in a way that it had never been seen before. And while the 240,000-mile trip to get to that vantage point was, I'm sure, amazing— I mean, if you ever get that offer, take it— if you don't have a spaceship and three days to spare, lucky for you, all you need to do is click a link to get almost the same view in about a second. This is the Earth, all 196.9 million square miles of it. Google Maps is for finding your way. Google Earth is about getting lost. Google Earth is the biggest repository of geo-imagery, the most photorealistic digital version of our planet. We're trying to create a mirror world so people can go anywhere. From mountains to cities to the bottom of the ocean. Google Earth has been around for about the last 10 years, and just like our Earth, it's been evolving over this time. The imagery has been getting better and better, I was really curious to know, how is Google Earth created? How many images actually make it up? And where do they come from? Last year, together with Lo, I met up with Gopal and Kevin to find out. So how do we build Google Earth? The way it starts is we look at places that we want to collect an imagery, and then we collect it through a variety of different ways. One is satellites and satellites give you the global views, and that's all 2D imagery that's wrapped around the globe. When you get closer to the ground, we have 3D data that we collect from planes. Yes, you heard right, planes. I had always assumed that every overhead photo of the Earth I'd ever seen was taken by a satellite. But I learned creating 3D imagery requires special conditions. So Google flies planes, or as I now like to think of them, street view cars with wings. What are some of the, like, challenges that you guys had. The biggest challenge in doing something like this is weather. Our preference is always to have clear skies. It took us a really long time to get London because we had to fly right. over London a lot before we got a fully cloud-free image of London. Come on in. Thanks. Kevin told us that a typical flight to take photos is around five hours. Except the planes aren't going across the country, they're making little zigzags over the same area. So it's north and turn south. It's sort of like mowing the lawn. This pattern helps the photos overlap, and multiple cameras help capture a place from different angles. In planes, we have five different cameras, one looking down and forward, back, left, and right. In my mind, I'm picturing like photograph, 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 yep. and then something puts them all together. <laughs> Something called an algorithm. Photogrammetry, yeah. Which is just a fancy word for taking all of this imagery that we collect from the plane and constructing a 3D model. The first step to creating a place in 3D is a little bit of photo editing. So all the imagery is sort of prepped. That would be removing clouds, removing haze, color correcting. You'll actually see that a lot of the cities don't even have cars in them. We actually take mm -hmm. the time to extract those. Then the 3D science begins. The big breakthrough that's happened in the last few years has been the introduction of computer vision. The computer looks for features within the overlapping images that are the same. We use a special GPS antenna that allows us to know where that camera was, so we know roughly where things were taken and at what angle. And this allows them to create a depth map. And that's just our understanding of how far the things are from the camera. And we take all of these various depth maps from the different cameras stitch those together in what's called a mesh, which is basically a big 3D reconstruction of the place, and we texture it. And texture it is applying the photography that we took to the sides of these 3D buildings. It's almost like taking pieces of paper and cutting them up. You can actually extract the edges of something and then stitch those together and then understand what that shape might be. And organic shapes are what's hard to render. It gets even more complicated when you're talking about trees, because trees have branches and leaves, and often you might see them as a lollipop because that's as good as we can get. But we're getting better at modeling those organic shapes. 
we did a collective Yosemite National Park and we were able to actually capture that in really high fidelity with all the different bends that a rock face might have. Do you know how many different images make up what I see as Google Earth? Yeah, it's probably on the orders of tens of millions. One interesting stat is to look at what we call pretty Earth. And this is the global view. So we have a full seamless image. And that comes from about 700,000 scenes from Landsat. And what we're doing is we're finding the best pixel from each. So if you look at Google Earth, it's springtime everywhere. To be precise, a 800 billion pixel spring globe, which is so big, if you wanted to print that out on your home printer, you would need to find a piece of paper the size of a city block. If you took a single computer, it would take 60 years to process that. And you can just keep multiplying this times all the different levels of zoom that exist in Google Earth, which are over 20. So even though using Earth feels like one seamless world that you're just zipping around, it's really more like you're traveling through a series of Russian dolls, all made up of puzzle pieces. I think everybody else wants to know, like, how often do the images get updated? <laughs> it's like the number one question. We try to update it as often as possible. The image all the way from space when you're looking at the whole globe, we try to update that maybe once every couple of years. As you start to dive in, we update that imagery more and more frequently. So like for big city populations, it'll be under a year. What that allows you to do is look at how the planet has changed over time. And we use this product called Earth Engine that allows you to look at all of this data and using computer vision draw out insights from the things that are changing. So we can track deforestation in the Amazon because we can see how the trees are shrinking and growing. And then from that we can generate a heat map of the most logged places on the planet. We can also do that with fishing and see the most overfished areas. Think about it as a health monitor for the planet. Watching these cycles happen on the planet, you realize that this is a living thing, and the product we're building has to be a living thing to reflect that, you know? It's not a static planet. It is fully alive at a macro scale, and that is very eye-opening when you're actually watching the things change right in front of your eyes, when you have that perspective to see that. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't played with Google Earth recently, I highly recommend this new feature they just launched called I'm Feeling Lucky. You roll the dice, and then it teleports you to a random spot in the world. Also, to give you a heads up, in the coming weeks, we'll be diving deep into VR, including Google Earth VR. So there's that to look forward to. Okay, that's all from me. Bye.